Recording in progress. Hello, I'm Michael Bronstein. I'm professor at Imperial College London and head of craft learning research at Twitter. And I will talk today about uh, geometric deep learning. This is a talk based on joint work with Jean Bruna, Petr Velichkovic, and Taco Coin. And uh, you can see more details at the website geometricdeeplearning.com. So before we go into geometric deep learning, I need to probably give you some context. So for nearly 2000 years, when we thought about geometry, we always thought about Euclidean geometry because no other types of geometry existed. And this monopoly of Euclid came to an end in the 19th century when the first examples of non-Euclidean geometries were constructed. And this very quickly created an entire zoo of different geometries. And towards the end of the century, these became disparate fields where questions such as which geometry is more general and what actually defines a geometry were asked. And um, an answer to this question was given by a young German mathematician called Felix Klein, who in 1872 was appointed as professor at the Bavarian University of Erlangen. And um, as it was customary, he was asked to present an inaugural research program, which entered the history of mathematics as the Erlangen program. And in this research program, Klein proposed approaching geometry as the study of invariance or symmetries. These are the properties that remain unchanged under some class of transformations that were formalized using the language of group theory, which gave immediately clarity which geometry is more general because uh, this can be understood as the relation between the respective groups. And this idea was very uh, profound. It uh, made a big impact in mathematics and also in other fields uh, of study, such as physics, where, for example, it was possible to show that you can derive conservation laws in physics from the first um, principles of symmetry a result that is known as Noether's theorem. And these ideas also evolved into what is called gauge invariance and uh, eventually became what we now know as the standard model, which we can be completely derived from uh, considerations of symmetry. And this is really the physics, all the physics with the exception of gravity that we know nowadays. So I can only repeat the saying of Philip Anderson, a Nobel winning physicist, that it's only slightly overstating to say that physics is the study of symmetry. Now, of course, symmetry is fundamental in nature, it's fundamental in physics, but you may wonder what does it all have to do with deep learning? So I think the current state of affairs in the field of deep learning is very reminiscent of the situation of geometry in the 19th century. On the one hand, in the past decade, deep learning has brought a revolution in data science, and it made possible many tasks that previously were thought to be completely impossible or science fiction, whether it's computer vision, speech recognition, or playing intelligent games such as Go. On the other hand, we now have a zoo of different architectures uh, of neural networks for different kinds of data and very few unifying principles. And as a result, it's very difficult to understand how these different methods are uh, related to each other. And this inevitably leads to reinvention of, and rebranding of the same concepts. So we think that we need some form of geometric unification in the spirit of the Erlangen program. And that's what we call geometric deep learning. And it's a common mathematical framework and principle to uh, derive most successful neural network architectures now used in deep representation learning from first principles. And second, it's also a constructive procedure to build future architectures in a principled way. So let's look at machine learning in probably its simplest setting. We can essentially regard it as a function estimation problem, where given the output of some unknown function on what we call a training set, typically the, the example that is given is labeled uh, images of dogs and cats, and we try to find a function from some hypothesis class that fits well the training data. And it allows us to predict the outputs on previously unseen inputs. So what happened in the past decade is that on the one hand, we had availability of large high quality data sets such as ImageNet. And on the other, we had uh, the growing computational power that allowed to design rich function classes that at least in principle can interpolate such large data sets. And neural networks appear to be a suitable choice to represent functions because even in the simplest choice of architecture, like the Pesceptron shown here, if we connect just two layers 
we can produce a dense class of functions, which allows us to approximate any continuous function to any desired accuracy, a property that is called universal approximation. Now, the setting of this problem in low dimensions is classical problem in approximation theory. It has been studied very extensively, and we have very precise control and results about the estimation errors. But the situation is entirely different in high dimension. We can quickly see that in order to approximate even a simple class of, let's say, Lipschitz continuous functions, what I show here is an, such example, a superposition of Gaussian blobs that are put in the quadrants of a unit cube. We see that as we grow the dimension of this cube, the number of samples uh, that is required grows exponentially fast with the dimension. This is a phenomenon that is colloquially known as the curse of dimensionality. And what we see that in modern machine learnings, we uh, machine learning problems, we need to operate with data in thousands or even millions of dimensions. So the curse of dimensionality is always there built into the problem. And it makes such a naive approach to learning impossible. And uh, this is perhaps best seen in computer vision problems like image classification, where even very small images tend to be very high dimensional. But if we look at them intuitively, they have a lot of structure that we break and throw away when we parse the image and feed it as a vector into the simple perceptron neural network. And now if I just shift the image by one pixel, the vectorized input will be very different. And the neural network will need to be shown a lot of examples in order to learn that shifted inputs should be classified in the same way. So the remedy for this problem in computer vision came from classical works in neuroscience. And uh, it served an inspiration for a new class of neural architectures with local uh, shared weights that resembles the organization of the visual cortex into what is called receptive fields. First, it was the neocognitive of Fukushima and then the classical seminal work of Jan Lekan, the convolutional neural networks where a weight sharing across the image effectively solved the curse of dimensionality. Now, let me show you another example. So what you see here is a molecule. It's a molecule of caffeine represented as a graph. And the nodes here are atoms and edges are chemical bonds. And if we were to apply a neural network to this input, for example, to predict some chemical property like the binding energy or the atomization energy of this molecule, we can again parse it to, into a vector. But this time, you see that any arrangements of the node uh, will uh, of the nodes will do because in graphs and like images, we don't have a preferential way of ordering the nodes. And molecular graphs are just one example of data with the regular non-Euclidean structure on which we would like to apply deep learning. And social networks are another prominent example. We also have interaction networks or interactomes in biological sciences, manifolds and meshes in computer graphics, and so on and so forth. So these are examples of data that we try to deal with in this framework of geometric deep learning. So let's look again at this multidimensional image classification example that at the first glance seemed hopeless because of the curse of dimensionality. Fortunately, we do have additional structure that comes from the geometry of the input signal. And we call this structure geometric priors. It's a general powerful principle, as we'll see, that gives us optimism and hope in otherwise dimensionality cursed problems. And in our example of image classification, the input image is not just a d-dimensional vector. It's a signal defined on some domain. In this case, it's a two-dimensional grid. And the structure of this domain is captured by a symmetry group. So in this case, it's the group of 2D translations. And this group acts on points on the domain. And in the space of signals, the group actions on the underlying domain are manifested through what is called the group representation. In our case, it's simply the shift operator. It's a D by D matrix that acts on the d-dimensional vector. Now, this geometric structure of the domain that underlies the input signal imposes structure on the class of functions that we're trying to learn, that are denoted here by F. And we typically have two examples. We can have functions that are unaffected by the action of the group, what we call invariant functions. And a good example is image classification problem, where no matter where the object is located in the image, we still want to say that it's uh, let's say a cat. So this is an example of a shift in variance. And uh, on the other hand, we can have a case where the function has the same input and output structure. For example, in image segmentation, the output is a pixel-wise label mask. We want the output in this case to be transformed in the same way as the input or what we call an equivariant function. Again, in this example, what we see is shift equivariance. 
So these two principles give us a very general blueprint of geometric deep learning that we can recognize in the majority of popular uh, deep neural architectures. We can apply a sequence of equivariant layers and then an invariant global pooling layer that aggregates everything into a single output. And in some cases, we can also create a hierarchy of domains by some coursing procedure that takes the form of local pooling in neural network implementations. This is another principle that is called uh, scale separation that I'm not going to discuss today. So this is a very general design. We can apply it to different types of geometric structures, uh, including grids, homogeneous spaces with global transformation groups, graphs, and manifolds. And uh, we call this the 5G of geometric deep learning. So the implementation of these principles leads to some of the most popular architectures that exist today in deep learning, whether it's convolutional networks that can be derived from translational symmetry, craft neural networks, deep sets, and transformers that implement permutation invariants, and the intrinsic CNNs that are used in computer graphics and vision that can be derived from what is called the gauge symmetry. And let me start with graphs. So we have probably different mental pictures when we think of a graph, but it's convenient to think of a social network where the nodes represent users and the edges represent their uh, interactions or relations. And we can also attach some features uh, to the nodes that we can model as d-dimensional vectors. Now, one key structure characteristic of a graph is that we don't have a canonical way to order its nodes. So any ordering uh, that allows us to uh, represent the, the features as a matrix and the adjacency matrix as uh, another matrix is defined up to the ordering of the nodes that can be arbitrary. And this can be represented as a permutation that is applied to the, to the, to the nodes or to the adjacency matrix and the feature matrix. So we have n factorial such permutations and that's the degree of freedom that we have here. Now, if you want to implement a function on the graph that provides a single output for the entire graph, like in our example of predicting energy of molecules, uh, we need to make sure that the output is unaffected by the ordering of the input nodes. Or in other words, we have a permutation invariant function. If on the other hand, we want to make node-wise predictions, like predicting malicious users in a social network, we want a function that changes in the same way as the input with the ordering of the nodes, or in other words, is a permutation equivariant function. And the way of constructing a pretty broad class of tractable functions on graphs is using the local neighborhood of the node, where we look at the nodes that are connected by an edge to some node i, and we aggregate the feature vectors together with the uh, feature vector of the node uh, itself. Because we don't have a canonical order of the neighbors, this must be done in permutation invariant way. So we have a symmetric or permutation invariant function phi. And if we apply it to every node, we get a function that is uh, permutation equivariant. Now, it appears that the choice uh, of this function phi is extremely important and it determines the expressive power of the resulting architecture. And uh, in particular, we can relate it to the, what is called the vice graph uh, uh, isomorphism test. Uh, when this phi, uh, function phi is injective, we can show that the graph neural network that is constructed in this way is equivalent to the vice versa element uh, test that determines if two graphs are isomorphic by some kind of iterative label refinement procedure. So here's the typical way our local aggregation function looks like. We have a permutation invariant aggregation operator, such as sum or maximum or average, a learnable function psi that transforms the neighbor features, and another function phi that updates the features of node i using the aggregated features of its, its neighbors. And uh, the output of this nonlinear function uh, that depends on both feature vectors of node i and j can be regarded as a message that is sent to update the features of node i uh, from the node j. And graph neural networks of this type are called uh, message passing. Now, if you look at a typical implementation of a graph neural network, a typical architecture, it's immediately recognizable as an instance of our geometric deep learning blueprint, where we have the permutation group as the geometric prior. And we typically have a sequence of permutation equivariant layers that are often referred to as propagation or diffusion uh, layers in the graph learning literature, and an optional global pooling layer that produces a single graph-wise output. So some architectures also include uh, local pooling layers obtained by some form of graph coarsening, 
that can also be made learnable. Now, let me say a few words about some interesting special cases of graph neural networks. So first of all, a graph with no edges is a set, and sets share the structural property of graphs that are unordered. So in this case, the most straightforward approach is to process each element of the set entirely independently. Basically, we apply a shared function phi to the feature vectors, and this translates into a permutation equivariant function over the set, which is a special setting of a graph neural network with an empty graph. And this architecture is known as deep sets or point nets in deep learning. Now, as another extreme, instead of assuming that each element of a set acts on its own, we can assume that now any two elements can interact. In this case, we have a complete graph and uh, we can use an attention-based aggregation that we can interpret as a form of learnable soft adjustancy matrix. And I hope we can recognize the famous transformer architecture that is now very popular in NLP application. It is also a particular case of a graph neural network. So here, it's a little bit of a cheating. I should say that transformers are commonly used to analyze sequences where the order of nodes is given. And this node information is typically provided in the form of what is called positional encoding. So it's an additional feature that uniquely identifies the node. So there are ways of uh, positional encoding for general graphs as well. But there are several ways that, that this can be done. And uh, one way of incorporating this information it was shown in the paper that we recently did with Georgos Buritsas and Fabrizio Frasca, my PhD students, where we counted small graph substructures such as triangles or clicks. And this way provided a kind of structural encoding that allows to adapt the message passing mechanism to different neighborhoods. And we call this architecture graph substruction network. It can be made strictly more powerful than the vice versa lemon test by appropriate choice of these substructures. And it is also a way to incorporate problem-specific and active bias. And for example, in chemistry, uh, we see that cycles are very prominent structures. And uh, we, uh, when we um, apply this architecture with cycles of certain lengths to classifying the properties of, uh, uh, of molecular graphs, we see that we are able to predict these properties much better when we are using uh, uh, rings of, and cycles of size, of size five, six, or more. So you can see that even in the cases where the graph is not given as input, graph neural networks still make sense. And even when the graph is given, we don't necessarily need to stick to it in order to do the message passing. Uh, in fact, a lot of recent approaches decouple the computational graph from the input one, and uh, usually it takes the form of either graph sampling or graph rewiring or using uh, larger multi-hope filters where the aggregation is performed on uh, uh, neighbors of the neighbors or bigger supports. We can also learn the graph on which to run the graph neural network, and uh, this uh, graph can be optimized for the downstream task, what uh, is typically called uh, latent graph learning. And uh, we can make this construction of the graph differentiable and backpropagate through it, and the graph can also be updated between different layers of the graph neural network. And one of such first architectures was a work that we did uh, together with colleagues from MIT that we called dynamic graph CNN. So let me now move to another types of geometric structures that we are probably very familiar with, and these are grids. And I hope to show you a slightly different perspective. So grids are also a particular case of graphs. And uh, for example, a grid with periodic boundary condition is called a ring graph. So compared to general graphs, the first thing that you notice on a grid is that it has a fixed neighborhood structure. In this example, we have exactly two neighbors for each node. And not only that, the order of the neighbors is fixed. And I remind you that on general graphs, we're forced to use a permutation invariant local aggregation function phi because we didn't have a canonical ordering of the neighbors. Now on a grid, we do. So we can always order our, uh, our uh, nodes, for example, green, red, and then blue. And if we choose a linear function with the sum aggregation operator, we get the classical convolution. And uh, if you write it as a matrix, we get a special structure called the circulant structure or circulant matrix. And uh, a circuit matrix can be formed by shifted copies of a single vector of parameters that I denote here by theta. That's exactly the shared weights in CNNs. Now, from the standpoint of algebra, circuit matrices are very special. They commute with respect to multiplication, which is unlike normal matrix multiplication. And in particular, they commute with a special circuit matrix that cyclically shifts the elements of a vector by one position. We call this the shift operator. So circuit matrices commutes, uh, commute with shift, 
which is uh, just another way of saying that convolution is shift equivariant operation. Now, this statement works in both directions. Not only every circuit matrix commutes with shift, but also every matrix that commutes with shift is circuit. So what we get is that convolution is really the only linear operation that is shift equivariant. And you can see here the power of our geometric approach. Convolution automatically emerges from translational symmetry. And uh, not only that, we can also see that all these matrices can be jointly diagonalized by the same eigenbasis, which uh, can be computed uh, in closed form as eigenvectors of the shift operator. And this happens the discrete Fourier transform. So this duality between performing convolution in the spatial and uh, frequency domain it also emerges from this fundamental principle of symmetry, in this case, translational symmetry. So let me now show you a more general case where our group formalism will be more prominent. And again, thinking of convolution as a kind of pattern matching operator, like an image, this is done by a sliding window, we can formalize it by defining a shift operator T that shifts the filter that I denote here by Psi, and then in a product that matches the filter to the image. So essentially what we do in convolution, we shift the filter by the shift operator, match it to the filter and record this uh, matching the, the value of the inner product uh, at each position. So we get the convolution or the correlation. Now, there is a very special thing here is that the translation group can actually be identified with the domain itself. So each element of the group, which is a shift, can be represented as a point on the domain to which we shift. Now, this is not the general case. And in general, we'll have the filter transformed by the representation of our group that I denote by rho. And the convolution, right, or the group convolution will now have values for every element of the group G. Now, the structure of this group can be very different from the structure of the domain. And let me show you one example, how to do convolution on this sphere. So in this case, the domain is the sphere. It's a two-dimensional manifold. And the symmetry group, group is SO3, the special orthogonal group, rotations that preserve orientation. So if you represent the sphere as uh, three-dimensional unit vectors, we can represent the actions of the group by orthogonal matrices R with determinant equal to one. So the conversion here is defined on SO3. We get a value of inner products for every rotation R of the filter. Now, as I said, this SO3, it's a, it's, it has a different structure. It's actually a three-dimensional manifold because on the sphere, we can rotate three ways. We can rotate along the, the, the parallels, along the meridians and around itself, right? So if you want to do another, layer of convolution, we need to apply it now on SO3, on the group. So it's a three-dimensional manifold where rotations themselves are points. I denote them by Q. And uh, the, this is what uh, it entails if we want to do a, a deeper convolutional uh, neural network on such a manifold. So I think I will conclude here. So. Uh, just to summarize, I didn't talk about manifolds, but uh, we started with this uh, desire to imitate the Erlangen program in machine learning as a way of geometric unification, trying to derive different deep learning uh, uh, architectures and networks from fundamental principles of symmetry. And uh, the different instances of this blueprint that we've seen today uh, emerged from the assumption of the domain underlying our data and the symmetry group that is associated with this domain. So this is truly the spirit of the Erlangen program applied to deep learning applications. Now, geometric deep learning methods have exploded in the past few years, especially craft neural networks. And uh, they already led to several success stories in industrial applications. And maybe in fundamental sciences, I think it's indicative that last year, two major biological journals, one of them is Cell and another one is Nature Methods, featured geometric deep learning papers on their cover. I think it means that it, it has already became the first class citizens, uh, citizen in the ML domain, uh, already mainstream methods, and they will possibly lead to new exciting results in fundamental sciences. So I will stop here. I would like to give credit to my wonderful collaborators uh, in this project. And the next talk will be given by Anastasia Varava. Thank you very much.